So we're at broadcast now. I think we're live in five. Yeah, we're live now. Great. Good afternoon, everyone. I am really looking forward to today's discussion. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Shane Bovell, and I am the founder of Way, um, an organization that helps prepare both youth markets and businesses for a future um, with advanced technologies. So what we're witnessing here today is an acceleration into the digital future. Across almost every industry, organizations have had to reposition themselves for a truly decentralized workforce. But we've also been given a unique opportunity to try, to test, and to see how malleable and durable our systems are to adapting, the most important skill at both the micro and macro level for the future of work. Today, we're gonna to hear from some thought leaders about the future of work, of how the future of work um, can be disrupted and what it will really look like going forward. Our first speaker is Robin Desutsan, author and managing director of Willis Towers Watson. Our second speaker is Ben Pring, VP director of Cognizant Center for the Future of Work. Our third speaker is Marielle Davis, co-founder and head of partnerships of Spoken. And our fourth speaker is Alex Levitt, author, speaker, and consultant in Futurist. So Robin, take it away. Great, thank you, Sinead. Hi, everyone. Uh, good morning, good afternoon. I'm gonna to attempt to share my screen here and hopefully we'll be successful. So I'm hoping you can, you can see that, it looks like you can. So I thought I might just spend a few minutes setting the stage with some data, with a perspective on how we see work evolving, and then hopefully leave you with a couple of frameworks to think about how you might go about on this journey of reinvention that Sinead talked about. I think Satya Nadella said it best when he said, you know, we've seen a 20 year trend on digitalization, it accelerated to 20 days. And certainly, you know, from a digitalization perspective, we've seen that, but when you overlay the other aspect of the future of work, which is the democratization of work, you actually see future of work being multiplied to be operating even faster. And, and I think some of what's reshaping how we think about work, how we think about organizations is a pivot from our traditional focus of chasing pure, uh, growth and efficiency to a growing awareness that you know, these new watchwords of resilience, flexibility, and agility are increasingly critical to our businesses. You know, we've talked about black swans as if they're the rarest of beasts, and yet we've had two in 12 years, right? Um, with the potential for another spike in reinfection rates um, and even more catastrophic change as a result of climate change being triggered in the next few years. And so, you know, these, these aren't quite as rare as we thought. So this point about resilience becomes increasingly essential. As we think about it, we think there is an urgent call for a sustainable reset of our business models, of how we think about organizations. And that has pretty significant ramifications for work. Many of these things are accelerating dramatically um, is as, uh, as we look at some of the trends, whether it's automation. We've been talking to clients um, every week since the end of January. And um, you know, we, we get several, you know, in some cases, several hundred, in some cases, several thousand responses to these questions. And we're seeing a 70% increase in organizations saying that they are starting to pursue automation in a more significant fashion as a result of this pandemic. We've seen a 20% increase in organizations thinking about operating beyond the organizational boundary, sharing talent. And so when we think about a sustainable reset, five things come to mind. The first is a portfolio approach to work. How do we orchestrate work in a way that is resilient to some of these shocks? How do we reinvent work? So we've got the optimal combinations of machines and human talent in a variety of functions, whether it's employees, whether it's gig talent, whether it's onshoring of work, which has become an incredibly hot topic of late, unsurprisingly, um, versus the use of independent contractors. Another key pivot is how do we ensure that we've got the flexibility as it relates to work to rapidly move talent to how work is being done. A couple of examples, Bank of America moved 3000 head office employees to actually deal with customer calls in their call centers as a result of the spike in 
Cole's view to the CARES Act. Kroger moved several, I think 1,800 head office employees to work in their stores, given the demand in their stores. So how do we create these more agile constructs with getting work done? The hottest topic in HR, as many of you know, is the internal marketplace. And I think that, again, is being accelerated by this pandemic. Um, a key, another key dimension is just leadership. How do we drive, in a world where shocks come quick and fast, distributed decision-making or decision-making from the edges becomes increasingly essential? How do we ensure that our colleagues on the front lines where innovation happens, where operational efficiency gets accomplished, where diversity is increasingly essential? Um, have the agility to make decisions with the same frames of reference without maybe some of the traditional biases they might have brought to the equation. Um, the fourth is just greater collaboration between companies. Um, one of the responses we got in our survey was a 20% increase in organizations thinking about how they collaborate with other companies, sharing talent from organizations that are seeing a trough in demand to those seeing a spike. We've seen that with McDonald's sharing talent with Aldi in Germany, um, uh, Cisco sharing its talent with, uh, with, uh, with Kroger as a way of both sharing the pain as well as maybe sharing the gain. And then lastly, um, I'm sure, I know many of you are having these conversations, this notion of flexibility really becoming the hallmark of the new deal. And it's more than just giving someone a laptop and saying be remote. Um, it's, it really truly is a cultural change given the primacy of the workplace in culture. And, and the last thing I'll say before I share a couple of frameworks for you to think about is the big challenge we have, I think, is this great dichotomy. We see this in our employee research. We talk to about 5 million employees every year. There is always a spike after every crisis, 9-11, the financial crisis, this pandemic, um, where people are trading off growth and opportunity in favor of certainty and stability. We as a species crave that, and particularly now. But for a profit-making enterprise, I think the best you get to promise is clarity on this journey and the promise of continued relevance for a changing world. So a couple of frameworks for you to think about. Um, I mentioned some of the data, so we can skip that. Um, but a couple of frameworks. The first is one that we developed um, back in 2015, and it's really about re-envisioning work and, and how these different options come together. So think of three continuums of choice, the assignment or the work, the, what it means for the organization, and then what it means for the value exchange between your workforce, whoever they might be, and your enterprise. On the left is where we've been for 150 years, work bound up in jobs, collected at a point in space and time, and employment being the dominant relationship. The resulting organization is pretty self-contained, very detached, protective of intellectual capital. Um, and the rewards are frighteningly similar to what Henry Ford had when he adapted the assembly line. Very permanent, collective and consistent, with a strong emphasis on the economic pay and benefits. The far right is this new world of work, work broken up into tasks, dispersed over space and time, and now you have a set of virtual or market relationships. In the United States, we went overnight from 2% of people working full-time at home to close to 40% of people working remotely because we didn't have a choice. The resulting organization, because of that change in work, is much more permeable, more collaborative. Um, its work and talent flow in and out more seamlessly. And the rewards are much more impermanent, individualized. And I think our big opportunity or challenge, perhaps even, is to figure out what stays on the left, what should be moving to the right, and where are there opportunities to perhaps keep some of the certainty on the left and blend that with the agility and flexibility that comes from the elements of the right. And then the last slide I'll share with you, I promise, is an overlay of this framework with the impact of automation. And this was a framework that my co-author John and I developed for our last book, Reinventing Jobs. And it's essentially a guide for business leaders on how do we get to the optimal combinations of humans and machines? How do we deconstruct work in steps one and two? How do we identify the goal we're trying to solve for? And then figure out the relevant type of automation, RPA, cognitive automation or AI, social robotics, and then a roadmap 
to where is their work that could be optimally substituted? Where are their truly human skills which get supercharged um, as a result of augmentation by technology? And then what new work or what work is transformed as a result of the presence of automation creating demand for ever new human skills? So with that, I will hand it back to Sinead. I think you're on mute, Sinead. There we go. Can you hear me now? Yes. Great. Um, so that was very impactful. And the follow-up question I would have for you then, uh, you made a really great point about after these crises, people crave certainty. But the certainty that we crave is going to look very different in the future because um, dynamic um, business relations, workforces, that is where we're headed. So what advice would you have for this group of people who crave certainty? What is the certainty of the future? I think the certainty for the future is your ability and the ability of your organization to keep you relevant. I have an airline client, believe it or not, that reframed their value proposition to say, we will develop you for opportunity either within or without which is an incredibly bold thing for an airline of all organizations to say when you sometimes have three generations of the same family there. You know, if, if you didn't promise certainty before, um, you know, nobody else could, right, it, when, in the old days. So I think it's the promise of, you know, we will keep you relevant. And I think that, frankly, needs to be the promise we make to ourselves, is the promise to stay relevant, because the pace of change, the quantum of change, the discontinuities, that we see in our world are just so significant that the best we can do is to sort of stay relevant in, in that era. Absolutely. Um, okay, well now, why don't we um, move on over to Ben um, and hear the leadership that you have for us today. Hi there, can you hear me? You can, good. Can I share my, my slides? This is always the ugly bit of uh, online presentations, isn't it? The, <laughs> the transition. Uh, Sinead, can everyone see that? Can you hear me okay? Great, thank you. Well, hi everybody, nice to be with you. I was a little late uh, getting on, so uh, good to be with you. Um, so I think I'm gonna be uh, <laughs> perhaps the, uh, the, dark, the voice of darkness today in this session. I know we're uh, trying to keep it quick and uh, a snapshot of, uh, of thoughts about our new world of work, the future of our work. Um, Jim asked me to take on this very thorny issue of surveillance. And obviously in 10 minutes, it's going to be uh, <laughs> hard to get too, too deep into this. But I want to sort of just give you a few thoughts that are very, very much in the front of my mind at the moment, uh, as we kind of morph into this after the virus age. Uh, in which obviously, as you, you've been talking about already, and I'm sure people have been talking about all, all day, the world's going to be very, very different. Um, and I want to pause it. You can probably see behind me that I'm a, a bit of a bookworm, a bibliophile. So I'm going, to pour, I'm going to sort of pose my questions in the context of a few books that I'm sure most of you have read. Um, I can't see the audience, so I don't know whether you're, you're nodding if I say, have you read this book? I'm sure most people have. I read this book when I was a young man in my teens. And one of the thoughts that went through my mind as I was reading it and continued to go through my mind after I read it was how did George Orwell's world of 1948, the UK of the 1948 when he wrote the book, how did that turn into Airstrip One in 1984? Because the book doesn't really answer that question. It doesn't really give you that context or that background. How did this happen? I thought about this a lot. A lot of people have thought about this a lot. And then it was in 2013 that this book by Dave Eggers, one of America's greatest writers, I think answered that question that nobody had really been able to satisfactorily answer before. And his answer in this book, terrible movie with Tom Hanks, but great book if you've not read it, um, was that really we seduced ourselves into the world of Orwell's nightmare. We seduced ourselves with technology into this world. And though he doesn't mention this thing, 
Eggers doesn't mention this thing. This is clearly what has seduced us all into the virtual online world that we all live in today. Um, and that seduction to me speaks to another book uh, on the required reading list for people like us, Huxley's Brave New World. And you'll, people who are familiar with that book will know the notion of Soma, the drug in which we, com we sort of made ourselves comatose as we fell in love with the technology. And I think that those big structural thoughts are extremely important for us at this moment in which we can see that software has eaten the world. We've seen demonstration of that this last weekend. And in which, because of this strange little thing that probably none of us have heard about as we sat down to our holiday lunch in December, uh, everything in our world is now on an exponential curve becoming more and more online. Everything that can go online is gonna go online. This has been happening for some time, but in reality, this has only altered the fringe of our society and now is in the process of changing the mainstream of our society. And this, of course, is the greatest, the latest example of that in which the logic of using tracing apps is completely irrefutable. Of course, we should use this technology to make ourselves safe. Any parent, any politician, of course, would agree with, with the use of this technology. But this leads us straight into the world of these two books, which again, perhaps some of you have read, and if you haven't, you should, because these are two of the most important books of our time, and they tell really two sides of the same coin, the world of commercial surveillance and the world of military, security-based uh, surveillance. And of course, there is one person and one company that is at the heart of both sides of that coin, and people will know Peter Thiel in his role in Facebook and Palantir. And so I'm very, very concerned about this. And I think that what's going on in the dark side of technology is absolutely key to understanding the rage that is being manifested in the world at the moment, in which we know that the rich are getting richer because of their use of technology, and those who aren't are getting left behind, in which we know that the military industrial complex now has a cyber overlay on it, and in which we can see this Orwellian world becoming more and more real. I think this rage is driven by this formula that many of you will know comes from this book, that the growth of capital is greater than the growth of the real economy. And tech is at the heart of this story. Tech is at the heart of this separation from winners, from losers, and the surveillance network, the surveillance net that is descending upon us in a way that would horrify Orwell, and frankly, horrifies me. It strikes me that this is an incredibly existentially important moment in human history. And I'm reminded of this famous quote that many of you will know, that there are decades when nothing happens and then weeks when decades happen. We are living in weeks when decades are happening. And the decisions we make individually, corporately, civilly, in society, are gonna shape the future direction of our society for years to come. I've written extensively about this, freely available up at Cognizant's website, but I do think that this is something we really need to think about as technologists, because we, like it or not, are at the heart of shaping the world that we're gonna live in in the future. And of course, I love technology, and of course there is a, a brave, perfect new world that we can create through technology, but we should also not ignore the fact that the technology is being used in ways that I don't feel comfortable with, and I wonder if many of you feel comfortable with as well. So Sinead, I'll pause there and see if anybody would like to. Uh, yep, I think you um, brought to light a lot of valid points um, about technology and the, the fears and the realities that the technology itself is neutral, what we do with it is not. Um, 
there's also generational views that differ in technology. So my generation, um, millennials, Gen Z, we've almost traded in our privacy for the democracy of information um, and unity. Um, and we're tech, this, these same technologies that are surveilling us um, also have you know, brought justice in a lot of places. So how do we balance the catch 22 of the good that comes with the same surveillance? Like what would a solution look like to you and one that would be sustainable across generations that may have different views? Yeah, of course, that's a good point. And Brad Smith from Microsoft's new book poses exactly that framework, the peril uh, and the promise, tools and, and weapons of technology. And, and as somebody who's been a technology analyst for 35 years, I absolutely understand the promise, the, 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 the benefit, the power of technology to make our world better. My point, though, is I don't think many people, and I, I don't think this really breaks out on a demographic perspective, understand the reality of what's happening. And that's why Shajana Zuboff's book is so important. Surveillance capitalism is so important. Because if you read that book, which many people haven't, I'm surprised how few people have read that book. You get into the, into the inside of what has happened in the last 15 years. And if you read it, I think you'll be horrified, as I was. It completely changed my perspective on what's going on. And the metaphor, the analogy that she frames, which I'll leave with people, I don't want to sort of take us too, down, too far down the rabbit hole, is that what's happened with data, in the use of data, in the trade-off, as you said, um, Sinead, between convenience and the, the, the upside of technology and the downside of it, is what has happened is analogous to what happened to the indigenous people in South America when the conquistadores came in the 15th and 16th century. Those people had no conception of the value of the land that they lived in. And the Europeans did have an understanding of the value of that land. And before the indigenous people understood that, the land was taken away from them. The ownership of the land was taken away from them. That's clearly what's happened with data. The data-based providers, the data-based brokers have conceptualized the use of data in a way that regular people, whether you're 16, and I would argue 95%, 98% of people who are 56, don't understand. That's why I think this notion of, of surveillance capitalism and then the flip side of that into the Snowden world is so troubling because we've in essence given up our right to that data. We've given up in essence any potential ownership of that data in a material way. And we can see that the companies who've be, been able to conceptualize this and monetize this are the companies that are in the fang bucket, Jim Cramer's uh, fang bucket. And I think that stretching away of wealth, again, loops back into this rage that people are feeling all around the world. What we do about this is, is clearly a big existential question, which in my 10 minutes <laughs> we're not gonna get into. But I do think that people really need to understand what is going on. And my fear and my concern, and why I'm so agitated about this, is that most people don't, including our politicians and leaders. Mm -hmm. um, the exhibit for my argument, of course, is uh, Mr. Zuckerberg's famous re response to a question from a senator. What's our business model, Senator? We sell ads. Mm -hmm. If senators don't understand what is going on, how can they legislate that? Mm -hmm. And I think, again, that's the structural issue we, as in the enlightened bourgeoisie, if you like, have to deal with. Absolutely. And I think the optimistic part of it, there are apps that people are developing that make our data anonymous. Um, and you know, when, when cars were invented for the first 20 years, they didn't really have seat belts. So at least we're only 15 years in. And if you look at the evolution of technology, you see that there is this catch up effect because things move so quickly because the rate of technological change is so fast now with the intelligence level of our technologies. Um, so are the dark sides that's, of it. That's exactly right we've laid the information superhighway, Al Gore's information superhighway. We've laid that in the last 25 years, but now there are no stop signs. There are no traffic lights. There's no road markings. The next 25 years 
is going to be our attempt to put in place that furniture, if you like, of the road, of the internet, to keep us safe and to be able to use it in a meaningful way. My point, though, is that the policy people, both here in the US, in Europe, don't know enough about the technology, don't understand enough about the technology, don't understand the detail of what's going on. And if they don't, how are they going to legislate it? Um, with that, we will pass it over to Marielle and take it away. It's all yours. Great. Thank you. Let's see if I can. So it looks like I can't share my screen. You should be able to now because I've just uh, stopped sharing mine. All right. Let's see. Hold on just a second, sorry. You know what, my slides are actually tangential to the remarks, they're not necessary, so I'm not even gonna focus on it. Uh, you know, Ben had said that he might be the sort of, uh, the, the darker side of this conversation, and I, I hate to say, Ben, it, it might not be you, it might actually be me. <laughs> I, I've, been, I've been asked to talk about the future of work in the developing world, and like so many of the topics on this panel, it would merit a full day's discussion and you know, still barely scratch the surface with that. But since I've only got 10 minutes, I want to focus on the future of work in the Middle East and North Africa. And I'll do this both because it's the region of the world that I know best, and also because it's the region whose recent history has in many ways been defined by workplace, workforce challenges. And so you know, in this place, the future of work holds particular social and political and economic significance. And I recognize that I've spent my career focused on the region, but a lot of you might be thinking about it um, from a very different perspective. So first I wanna provide a little bit of context on the immediate impact that COVID has had in the Middle East and North Africa or MENA region. And then we'll look at two of the most important forces in my eyes that will define the future of work there. The first is sort of the mix of demography and skills and the second is women's employment. And you know, as I alluded to, it's, it's a pretty bleak outlook. And so I want to wrap with a discussion about actions and investments that could actually help to change the course. So it's difficult actually to talk about the post COVID future of work in the Middle East and North Africa, because we're not actually sure what the COVID, what COVID itself will do to the region from a public health perspective. Uh, in almost every country in the region, you know, the curve is still increasing. And so there are a lot of unknowns in terms of public health. But what is far more certain is MENA's ensuing workforce crisis. And, you know, the Middle East and North Africa region, it has some of the rate, the highest rates of regional inequality in the world. So you have quite rich oil producing states like Qatar or Saudi Arabia, along with lower middle income states like Egypt or Jordan or Morocco as well as economies, fragile states or low income states like Yemen or Syria or Libya. And really whether rich or poor, countries in MENA are dealing with not one economic crisis, but two. The first is the fallout from COVID. And then there's also the added shock in global oil prices. And this is a calamitous mix when it comes to the future of work. You know, countries like Egypt and Morocco and the UAE had invested heavily in service and in hospitality as sectors that would be key job generators. And these have been decimated. And the halt of global trade and, and travel and production has destroyed so much demand for oil. The resulting collapse in oil prices had a huge impact, not just on the countries that produced oil, but also on oil importing countries because these countries had relied on remittances from millions of workers that they sent abroad for energy jobs. And in addition, they were relying on investment and capital flows from oil exporters to advance education and workforce initiatives that were intended to help the region's economies and the region's workforce withstand and benefit from some of the changes that would be brought on by AI and automation. So this economic devastation of COVID, as well as the, the shock in global oil prices, this overlays serious challenges that existed before COVID that were standing in the way of the Middle East and North Africa region really successfully navigating its way in, into a bright future of work. And the first of these two challenges that I want to talk about is 
the intersection of demographics and skills for work. So the Middle East and North Africa is actually one of the youngest regions in the world. 65%, 65% of the population is under the age of 30. And in the years before COVID, this could have been considered a demographic dividend, but instead it was all too often seen as a demographic time bomb for primarily just one reason, and that was unemployment. You had incredibly high unemployment among young people in the Middle East and North Africa. Prior to COVID, one in four young people was unemployed, and this was probably a very conservative number. So reasonable question to ask why. There are a lot of reasons, but the one that I want to focus on is actually related to education and skills. And you know, the region had made significant investments in education and expanding access to education over the past few decades. But crucially, these investments were not tied to the skills needs of the private sector. And so we had large numbers of youth with degrees they couldn't use. The result is that even before COVID, you had a paradox which was high numbers of unemployed young people with businesses that could not find candidates with the skills that they needed. And you might have expected that this skills gap would exist in technical skills. And in some cases, this is true. But in the majority of cases, the gap is actually in behavioral skills. And so it's sometimes called soft skills, like critical thinking or leadership or teamwork. And this gap in essential behavioral skills limits growth and innovation in large firms, but it also hampers the growth of SMEs and startups in the region. And this is particularly tragic because it had been hoped that startups could help economies in the region leapfrog decades of stagnant growth and increasing unemployment. But in addition to challenges like access to finance, and uh, problems with regulation, experts actually believe that a paucity in, in these critical thinking, problem solving, and leadership skills among young workers in particular, it will limit innovation in fast growth startups, and it will reduce productivity of employees within traditional SMEs. So in the wake of COVID, we have a, a large pool of young people, and they'll be competing with, even, with each other for even fewer opportunities. So I think it's safe to say that unless major changes are made for the rising workforce in MENA, you know, the future of work looks more like the future of no work. So the, the second dynamic that I wanted to talk about is COVID's impact on women's employment and what that might look like in the future. And from this start, I want to say that the situation for women differs dramatically from one country to another in the region. So there are really important exceptions to what I'm about to describe, and I'm happy to go over that in, in Q&A. But first, I, I think it might surprise a lot of people in the United States or in Europe that in many countries in the Middle East and North Africa, women both out-represent and outperform their male peers in universities, and this includes in STEM fields. But those education gains are not reflected in women's participation in the workforce, and you have fewer than one in five women participating in the labor force in the region. And there are a range of reasons why women in the past have opted against or were prevented from pursuing work. These might include sort of social and cultural norms about responsibilities to the family or to children, um, discriminatory laws and practices, concerns about workplace and, and commute safety, and also strong stigmas around certain types of jobs as being appropriate or inappropriate for women. And COVID has supercharged these concerns. The closure of skills of schools and the incidence of illness uh, among family members will disproportionately impact women as they shoulder a greater burden when it comes to caretaking, even when both parents work. And in some communities where women were already discouraged from working because their commute was considered uh, unsafe or the workplace was not considered safe for them, the possibility of contracting COVID while in the workplace or while on your commute will only further limit women's access to employment opportunities. So as I said, overall, not the brightest picture for the future of work in the Middle East and North Africa. And the implications are really far reaching. You know, if you look back not too far in history, you could see that jobs anchor peace. 
and the Arab Spring and subsequent conflicts in the region, these suggest that instability um, and jobs are, are tightly linked. And we should do everything we can to offer young people in the region the opportunity for, for meaningful and decent work. So I think right now I should talk a little bit about what can be done. Uh, the first is to make young people in the Middle East and North Africa, granted around the world, more employable. We need to support skills training programs that equip young people for jobs that will withstand COVID both in the immediate term and in the long term. And so, you know, I, I look to an organization, Education for Employment, that is really a leader in this space in the Middle East and North Africa. You know, they're offering nursing training to young women nurses in Palestine and are training 5,000 nurses and doctors online to give COVID-related care in Tunisia. But they're also going beyond that with an eye towards the future of work after this immediate crisis. So training young people in, you know, both the technical and soft skills to be a participant in the, in the online gig economy. So that means pairing skills in programming and graphic design with skills in negotiation and self-time management and self-efficacy to help young people build careers that will be in the gig economy. And the second thing I want to talk about as a, as a, a, a opportunity for us to improve outcomes is that developing countries need thriving homegrown SMEs and startups now more than ever before. And we need to improve the scale and productivity of these SMEs and startups so they can generate economic growth and job opportunities. So in my mind, skills building and access to information will play a huge role in this. this strong leadership and management uh, and strategic insight, these are vital for small businesses to navigate a turbulent future and to lead companies to growth in any country, and perhaps especially in countries as challenged as those in the Middle East and North Africa. And the good news is that young entrepreneurs in the MENA region are exceptionally digitally savvy and they are hungry for knowledge. So we need to invest in platforms that leverage their digital comfort and connect them to the best and most relevant insights from anywhere in the world. And the same is also true for the employees that might work in those businesses because their productivity will make or break the success of small companies and startups. So developing world SMEs need access to the same type of professional training and development opportunities that will help their counterparts in the US or in Europe weather the COVID storm. And you know, my company has spoken, we're, we're rolling out an app for affordable leadership and employee development so that SMEs in the developing world will have access to the same type of soft skills or management or innovation insights from Harvard Business School and MIT and McKinsey that our customers in the US do as well. And I'll close with a final recommendation, which is to use this moment to protect women's employment and to push for even more gains. You know, we need to provide additional support in the Middle East and North Africa for childcare and to take advantage of the social disruption that's caused by COVID to ensure that women occupy a much broader space in MENA's future of work. We need to prepare them to hold those critical first responder roles and logistics roles that will actually open the doors for them to work in these roles after the crisis subsides. So as I said, uh, the odds are long, but I think with the right investment, developing regions like the Middle East and North Africa can, we hope, use the disruption of COVID to leapfrog and to catalyze deep and lasting change for success in, in the future of work moving forward. So I'll hand it back to you, Shanine. Um, no, that was great and really eye-opening. If there's one piece of advice that you could give to everybody listening on the micro level of what we could do to contribute towards change, what would that look like? like what could we do on a micro level that the aggregate of which um, is transformative? I, I will put a plug in again for my favorite social enterprise working in the region, um, Education for Employment. They're doing a great job working in some of the hardest hit nations, whether it's Yemen um, or you know the West Bank or Gaza providing really important education and opportunities to young people there. And you know they always have an eye towards the, the types of jobs that will be offering opportunities, you know, not just for the next year, but for the next five years, for the next 10 years. And so I would recommend to, to go and visit their website. They're doing great work. Great, thank you. That's very helpful. Um, okay, and then our final speaker today, Alexandra. So take it away. Hi, everybody. My name is Alexandra Levitt. Let me just make sure I can share my screen. It looks like I have to reverse those, right? Can you all see that? 
the most effective way to transition? Not yet. Okay. work. Can you all see that? Yeah. This is the most effective way to transition to a fully distributed workforce. Okay, terrific. That um, is on the opposite monitor that I thought it was going to be, but no problem. We're all about rolling with technology, especially because we are futurists. So my name is Alexandra Levitt. It has been really exciting to hear all of the, my fellow speakers today. I loved how everyone took a, a really deep dive into their individual areas, which is important because I think that this topic of the future of work is very broad and can be very daunting. And as a couple of people mentioned, there are many, many ways and, and strategies that we could use to discuss this. And so my particular area that I'm gonna talk about is distributed work and how to do it right. So obviously with COVID, we've seen a lot of things happen. We've seen employers moving large segments of their population um, to work online. This has been a bit of a patchwork solution. Um, and only a few strategic leaders have really put vigor behind this. They've, they've really started to think about what's the most effective and productive way to do distributed work. Now, fully distributed work, just to level set what that means, that means that all of your people are working from home or another location. There is no one physical base of operations where people are working together in an office. You've got everybody working in different locations. So fully distributed work means 100% of your people are working from different locations. Some organizations were fully distributed before the pandemic, but I think that we're going to see this increase. And it's understandable. We have entered this situation very, very quickly, very suddenly, and we've been winging it. That's fair. Um, and what we really need to do to ensure that we can really understand the gains that can be made by distributed work is we have to take a wider lens. And so that's what we're gonna talk about in the next like eight minutes or so. We are gonna talk about what can be learned from fully distributed organizations and how we can do this effectively. So it's not just slapping everything up online, but instead we're really making the most of the technology platforms that we have available to us. And specifically, I'm gonna talk about three strategies, um, getting comfortable managing remote teams, adopting asynchronous processes and investing in the proper support. So getting comfortable managing remote teams. So the first thing here, to fully realize the benefit of distributed work, you've got to get away from this strong preference to have people work on site and use company space and equipment at a scheduled time. And what we see happening with a lot of organizations is that, well, COVID's an emergency. So we have to let everybody work from home, but we really would rather not do it if it's not an emergency. Well, if you have this point of view, then you don't have the necessary infrastructure to fully support distributed work. And when employees do try to do it, it's slow and it's clunky. So being comfortable with this means trusting your employees. You can cultivate trust by communicating, let people know that you're there to support them, giving them feedback and the freedom to do their jobs in the way that they think is most appropriate. Uh, during the pandemic, and this is, this is kind of a sticky issue here, but I do think on the topic of surveillance, I do think it's important to, to know what people are doing. You don't have to use software to record their every move um, or micromanage their daily tasks. It's more about having this concrete idea of whether people are accomplishing their goals as efficiently or more efficiently than they did in the office. And when it comes time to ease restrictions, which is already starting to happen, you want to seek employee feedback about the best way to do this. Um, a survey tool is a great option um, to collect information on a broader scale. Um, you might find that some employees are more comfortable coming back to the office sooner um, and others are not. And this is information you, you, you have to have. Third strategy we're going to talk about, asynchronous processes. So as I mentioned, many companies have simply moved the activities that they've been doing in person online. Um, and we have a lot of tools that have helped us do this. Microsoft Teams, Zoom, which we're using, Google Hangouts. Um, these facilitate real-time meetings. So people can share drives, email, company applications. 
Um, but what we are seeing is that everyone is largely working the same hours, whether they have distractions or not. So even if you're trying to homeschool your kids, you've still got to work during those normal business hours. And I highly recommend, there's a great podcast, it's called um, Sam Harris is Making Sense. And on a recent episode, uh, the automatic CEO and the founder of WordPress, Matt Mullenweg, he shared this really cool secret for effective distributed work. So a move from synchronous processes where everyone performs tasks at the same time to asynchronous processes where employees work on their own time. So for example, a synchronous process might require people to travel, sit in a meeting room, provide immediate reactions to some content or some idea. And an asynchronous process might involve presenting an issue via instant message, then maybe you prompt team members to think about it for a while, and then they respond um, by a predetermined deadline. But they've got a lot more freedom and wiggle room in terms of when they respond. So a couple things to think about. Evaluate whether set business hours are necessary, and if so, for whom. Um, you've got to have customer service staff around at certain hours. That's just kind of a given. So they might not have as much flexibility as others. Um, consider how you might change your performance model um, to evaluate people on the quality of their work um, versus the time it took to produce certain things. Um, for example, you might think about an agile performance management system where you use continuous feedback between a manager and employee um, to accomplish and reconfigure goals as real-time business needs mandate. And then again, make sure you're measuring your employees on their progress in real time as well. When you stop relying on synchronous processes, I, I think organizations will see a lot of benefits. You've got talent to source. You can source talent across the globe, which is Marielle was talking. Um, this is a great way to leverage talent in um, the Middle East and North Africa, and provided we can provide the necessary technology support. Think about assembling teams based not on who's geographically proximal to you, but who's best for the job, right? And this way you can actually move operations forward 24 hours a day uh, because employees can pass the baton to their overseas colleagues. I think the pass the baton was something Matt Mullenweg mentioned. And I love the idea of an organization working um, 24 hours because they can. The final thing I want to talk about before we close today um, is investing in proper support. So inevitably, if you're getting rid of some physical operations, you might have some extra funds to supply the proper equipment and tools to do distributed work right. Um, we require a lot of things. They're not expensive, but they are pretty mandatory. Uh, solid audio gear, um, good desk lighting. I've got a ring lamp behind me right now to light up my face. Uh, a reliable Wi-Fi connection. Um, it's actually worked out a lot better than I thought it was going to be, um, by and large, with the people I've worked with. And in terms of team collaboration, keep in mind some channels are better for synchronous work, um, like video conferencing, while others are better for asynchronous work, like instant messaging platforms. And your unique mix depends on the requirements of your business. Um, some distributed organizations have already figured it out. Uh, there's an automation tool called Zapier um, that is fully distributed. They've got workers across 13 different countries and they use Slack, a tool for group chat. They use Google Docs and Hackpad for documentation, Trello for project management, and they even have an internal blog. So they figured out what is the mix of tools that's going to make our workforce the most productive. One comment on security, <laughs> and Ben talked a little bit about this, but you might want to beef up your online security uh, because distributed work um, makes your business far more vulnerable to bad actors uh, because there are more entry points into, into the VPN, into um, your company's intellectual property, et cetera. And also, since there are fewer opportunities to speak with people face-to-face, um, offer your staff training in written communication skills because it's easy to be misunderstood. And it also doesn't hurt to boost their applied technology skills, which is the being able to leverage people, processes, data, and devices to do your job more efficiently, to do it better. So in other words, you understand the technology that's out there um, to do your job and you're, you're able to, to use it with, um, with relative efficiency. 
also make the most of in-person gatherings. That's probably the, the last thing that I have to say. Even a move to fully distributed work um, doesn't mean you never have to meet the people that you work with, but take advantage of those opportunities to really build rapport and have fun and be very strategic about doing things in person that are not as possible to do online. And it does require thinking about getting together in person um, in a way that uh, we haven't thought about before. Someone even suggested to me yesterday that fully distributed work in-person gatherings, you might not even bring your devices because what do you need those for if you're just gonna be talking to people? So that's an interesting way of looking at it. And I think that we're going to need some more creative approaches like that. So that's the end of my official remarks. Thank you all so much for being here today. And Sinead, back to you. Great, um, and if you had to pick your absolute favorite tool for distributed work, what would that be? Which one would it be? You know, I would have said at the very beginning, I would have been very skeptical about Zoom, but now I think Zoom is my favorite tool. I feel like it really allows me to do everything that I need to do. I even was on a webinar um, the day before yesterday with 200 people on it and somehow Zoom delivered. <laughs> I'm not exactly sure. I really thought it was going to crash, um, but it, it didn't. And it's just proved to be really nimble and support the, the needs of, of everybody who's working from all over the place these days. So a little plug for Zoom and hopefully it won't go down on us while uh, we're talking here today. And do you think um, given kind of the data concerns with Zoom or the fact that managers can monitor employees based on like an old model of efficiency, like how often they're actually on the computer versus their output. Do you think that it's progressive in that sense or would that be something that you should be wary of uh, as a leader? Well, I think that like with anything, you, you, we really have to change our way of thinking about productivity and what it means to accomplish business results. And I think with fully distributed work, there's a little bit of an extra emphasis on determining what business priorities are in real time and then making sure that employee goals are being configured around those business priorities so that it's not necessarily about whether you're sitting in front of the screen, but it's, it's well, we need this, we need all hands on deck on, in this part of the business. We're moving people around, we're making it happen like Robin was saying, and how can we measure the efficiency and the productivity in, in the sense that the business needs that we have today are being met. So I think that that's, that's part of agile performance management, which we could certainly talk about. Um, but if I were a manager, I would be really trying to look at it that way, particularly because we can't be so rigid. I mean, everybody is running in a million different directions. There have been several crises in um, the last couple of months globally. And so we just have to be a little bit more tolerant about how we do work and how we measure um, people's performance. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, and I know we don't have that much time, but a few quick questions for any or all of you to kind of jump in on. Um, given that the future of work will look very different, that's I think the one thing that we can all agree on, um, and it will require a lot of different things than what we're used to right now in work. Um, how much of the future of skills and learning do you think should be on the employees to take initiative to go learn and how much is on the leader? And I'll preface this with saying, there was a study that IBM did on 350 CEOs in the United States who believe that it is actually on the employee to prepare for the future. The same way they probably aren't gonna send you to university, they likely won't send you to upskill or reskill. Um, and AT&T, for example, offers upskilling courses, but you have to do that on your own time. Europe is a bit more um, hand-holding, Canada somewhere in the middle, as always, you know, I hope both sides win. Um, and then the US, it's a bit more independent. What are your thoughts on how much initiative the employee needs to take in preparing versus what's on the leader? Sinead, maybe I'll, I'll just go first. I, I really think it has to be both, you know. Um, I also think that in this debate about skills, we often forget the will side of the equation and I'm sure my panelists will, will resonate with this, you know, because we've all had countless encounters with um, particularly employees in the Western democracies, because this pivot around the future of work is a fundamental cultural challenge to everything that we've been taught and what we've grown up with, right? Because we've always, it's society here has been predicated on the belief that if I did the right thing, if I got my four year degree, my children, I, I will be entitled to a better life than my parents and my children a better life than me. That deal is gone. 
And I encounter continuously in the work that I do, and it's not just workers on an oil rig. I've seen this with investment bankers. The fundamental belief that, you know what, what do you mean I've got to reskill? What do you mean I've got to take six months out to acquire a new set of skills? Because I spent the last 20 years doing X, Y, and Z. And so I think that's a fundamental challenge. And it's truly fascinating to contrast this mindset, Marielle, with the mindset that you might see in the Middle East and North Africa versus what you might encounter in India or China or the Philippines, because the contrasts are pretty significant. So I do believe we have to own it, but I, do, I also think there is a massive responsibility in organizations and the smart ones get it, right? If you look at a Unilever, they truly get it. They understand that the promise of relevance is the, 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 the heartbeat of the new deal. It's not just come here and work for good pay and maybe a half decent pension. Thank you so much. Can I just jump in? Um, we're almost about time. Can we give each of you 20, 20 seconds just to answer that so Rovin doesn't get the final word so everybody can just. <laughs> we don't uh, want a problem to get the final word. Exactly. We really don't <laughs> want him to get the final word. No, I'm kidding. Um, but if everybody wanted to say something, let's wrap it up in about 20 seconds max. I'll just close with some research uh, that I did with DeVry University's Career Advisory Board last year that showed that the majority of employers want employees to be far more proactive with their own professional development and skill acquisition. So the employers think the employees need to be uh, more vigilant, and I'm sure that there's research that shows that the reverse is true as well. So Alexandra was the perfect lead in for me, which is that whether or not we consider it the responsibility of employees or employers, we need to make learning more convenient for people. We need to remove the friction and we need to remove the formality if we're going to make people understand that they have to be continuously learning throughout their lives. Uh, 20 seconds. Yes, that's tough. I, I think, Sinead, you called that at and I think their model makes a lot of sense. Uh, there's personal agency. Ultimately, we're all responsible for our own journey through life. But if an employer wants to be an employer of choice in the future, then they can't uh, ignore the responsibility they have. And so I think they've struck a very nice balance. I've, I've been talking about that for a few years now. I think that's a good model for other big corporations and, or, and, and individuals within organizations to think about. Absolutely. And I like that. An employer of choice. I think that is an important one. Um, okay, well, that's all from me, and I know we want to stick to the schedule. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you guys so much, and um, yeah, really, really interesting talk. Thanks, everybody. It's a Thank pleasure. You. All right. Bye.